Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome everyone to this first virtual supplier day in Equinor's history. My name is Peggy Kranstunderland, and I'm the Chief Procurement Officer in Equinor, which means I'm responsible for Equinor's global procurement, the contract portfolio, and supply chain. Up until today, our supplier days have been physical meetings, but due to the COVID-19 restriction, this has been transformed to a digital event. And although it's sad not to be able to meet physically, this gives us the chance to reach out to our large global supplier base. We have sent the invitation to several thousands of our suppliers around the world. There is a limit of the event of 20,000. So if you are here now and we have reached the limit, you are one of the lucky ones. However, since this is the first time that we do this, Please excuse us if technology doesn't serve us right. We are exploring the potential that lies with, within our digital toolbox and bring all our learnings from this session with us to new events. So let's get started. I hope you will find this session interesting, engaging and informative. In Equinor, we always uh, start our meetings with a safety moment. We will do the same today and this time through a video of a digital inspection at Equinor's Mariner installation. You might see a familiar face in the video, our incoming CEO, Anders Operal. This was filmed when he was still the executive vice president for technology project and drilling. Many of you know Anders well, and he also knows the uh, supplier industry very well. He has worked in Equinor since 1997. Before this, he was in the supplier industry with Schlumberger and Baker Hughes. And Anders has also had my role as Chief Procurement Officer a few years back. Let's watch the video. At the moment, it would have taken us one month to spend a few hours on the rig uh, on Marina. Uh, first uh, trip to, to Aberdeen and then 14 days in quarantine and then the trip offshore and then 14 days in quarantine coming back to, 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 to Norway. So, so no, this is absolutely a faster and a better way of doing it in these circumstances. And uh, that we're able to do it. Uh, I just have to say thank you for all of, of those uh, that's been made it uh, possible. And I really look forward uh, to meet you all uh, during this uh, offshore trip uh, in the digital uh, space. As you can see, it's a, a lovely day out here in Mariner. Come down to the catwalk of the dead with our TFM machine. I'll then step forward a bit here and have a, a quick scan of the pipe deck. As you can see, it's, a, it's quite a lot of 20 inch tube in there. that you know this sentiment about you know, the first virtual offshore visit that we're doing here so Mariner is part of leading the way for how we could do this for uh, for the rest of the fleet as well when uh, as long as this situation is ongoing and it also opens up for other opportunities. I am very, very proud that we have completed this first virtual offshore visit in the company. Uh, that's my understanding. It's the first uh, virtual visit that we do actually uh, on a rig. I'm very proud as a company we did that. And I'm also, of course, very proud that it happened here in Marina. Safety is always our first priority. As for all, COVID-19 has affected Equinor and how we conduct our tasks. From the video, you saw that the decks were well organized and seemed to be in good order. And this safety moment was recorded in the second quarter when we had a particular focus uh, on personal injuries and how to always think of potential hazards. How to become even better at identifying hazards at work, take good measures and involve each other in this work. Safety inspections are very useful in this regard. And when the pandemic hit and a normal inspection 
it became difficult. It is amazing how technology allows us to do this digitally and in a more efficient manner. The pandemic has accelerated digitalization and brought out new opportunities. And this is a nice bridge to the theme of this year's Supplier Day, leveraging joint opportunities. The live event will cover reflections around this topic, how we can navigate through the current challenging content to together and create win-win solutions for the industry. I will be joined by three colleagues in Equinor, Al Cook, Executive Vice President for Global Strategy and Business Development, who is going to guide us through Equinor's strategy and climate agenda. Anna Sigvenilun, Executive Vice President for Development and Production Norway, who will tell us more about the future of the Norwegian continental shelf. And Gerd Tungesvik, Executive Vice President of Technology Project and Drilling, who is going to speak about Equinor's attractive project portfolio. We also have two supplier representatives joining us. This is Uwem Ukkogbom, who, who is Executive Vice President for Regions, Alliances and Enterprises Sales for Baker Hughes, and Mats Andersen, CEO of ABO. They will give us exciting presentations around the topics of digitalization and the low carbon transition. And further to illustrate that this is really a global event, suppliers have called in from all over the world and speakers are seated at various locations, London, Oslo, Stavanger, Bergen and Houston. And since there are so many participants in the call today, uh, it would not be possible to send in live questions. So therefore we ask you to send us questions up front. The engagement has been impressive. So thank you very much for that. We will cover as much as we can in the moderated Q&A that will follow the presentations. And some of the topics that engage us the most are energy transition, digitalization, new energy, and our project portfolio. But first, let's take a short recap on how the COVID-19 pandemic has hit our industry. This spring, the in energy industry experienced a historic black swan situation. It was characterized by unpredictable events with severe impacts. And as all of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the world. And in addition, there was a dramatic fall in oil price. Our industry went through supply and demand shocks at the same time. Nobody saw this coming and rapidly the industry experienced a sharp decline in global upstream spend and activity forecasts became uncertain. An extraordinary situation for everyone, both for operators, suppliers and many, many others. Many suppliers still struggle after the price fall in 2014, and the industry is more vulnerable now than the last downturn. Margins are generally lower, and capital reserves and access to liquidity is more limited than it used to be. On top of this, many countries, including Norway, experience an increase in COVID-19 infection rates again. And there is a heightened risk that we will see an upswing of the pandemic in larger parts of the world over the next months. This could, together with the financial challenge caused by the fall in oil prices and activity reduction, cause even further negative uh, uh, consequences for the industry. And Equinor's attention in this situation includes the whole supply chain and how we work together with you to avoid supply chain bottlenecks. We want a sustainable price level, both for us and for you. When the crisis hit, Equinor decided not to renegotiate the whole contract portfolio. However, we all need to acknowledge that future oil and gas is becoming more marginal business and renewables are al already there. So the industry cost must come down. And there are so many opportunities that can increase the efficiency and reduce cost. We proactively investigate cost reductions and we expect US suppliers to do the same for our industry. We are in this together. This is a challenging joint context and we need to explore new ways of working and seek win-win solutions. Equinor completely rely on suppliers to deliver on our ambitions and together we need to secure a resilient supply chain and profitable industry for the future. And with that introduction, I would like to give the word to Al Cook to guide us through Equinor's strategy and the climate agenda. 
Al is currently Equinos Executive Vice President for Global Category and Strategy and Business Development, as I said. Coming from BP, he joined Equinor in 2016 as the Senior Vice President in our international business, overseeing operations in Angola, Argentina, Azerbaijan, Nigeria, uh, Libya, Russia and Venezuela, before moving into his current role as a member of the Corporate Executive Committee in 2018. Please, everyone, give a warm virtual welcome to Al. Thanks so much, Peggy, and, and thanks for the welcome and the, the great introduction. I'm so pleased to be able to speak to you all today. I'm, I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us on this call. We in Equinor have 9,000 direct suppliers and every single one has been invited. And it's great to see everyone. I'd have loved it if we'd been able to get together in a, in a room. But this virtual way of meeting creates a different form of intimacy and also allows people to join from different countries around the world. So it does have its benefits. So thank you, whether you're joining from a boardroom or a bedroom, from a shed or from a function room, where we welcome you to this event and to discuss a topic which has become even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is leveraging opportunities together. It's been more than six months now since we saw the significant spread of COVID-19 and it's affected us at a global level, a national level, a local and a personal level. Peggy rightly calls it a black swan event and I couldn't agree more with that. Governments around the world have shut down their economies whilst providing trillions of dollars of support to try and help their businesses and their citizens. Restrictions on travel and reduced industrial output have significantly impacted oil and gas demand and hence significantly impacted our industry. Whilst there's now been some recovery in that demand, there is unfortunately a growing consensus from forecasting agencies that a return to normal for oil demand will take longer than previously anticipated, probably until 2022 or 2023. We in Equinor believe the global demand this year will have fallen by 8.5 million barrels a day. And next year, it will only recover by 6.8 million barrels. So you can see that it's going to take some time to get back to normal. Recent mobility data suggests that recovery has plateaued in some areas. And I only need to look out of the window to see how few planes are still flying overhead. And while stimulus packages are helping to counter economic decline, at least for the major economies, important questions remain unanswered. Are we approaching a second wave of strict lockdown? Will we see lasting behaviors, behavior changes in the way people take flights and public transport? How quickly will we get a vaccine? And when we get that vaccine, how effective will it be? Answers to all of these questions will affect how fast, how just, and how green our recovery will be. But despite Despite all of these changes, some things remain constant. Amongst those is our strategy, which, as I hope you know, can be summarized as always safe, high value and low carbon. And that's what I'd like to go through now and tell you a little bit about what we're doing in these strange circumstances that create the current environment. Let me start with always safe. Just a couple of minutes ago, you'll have seen Peggy taking us on a virtual tour of Mariner, a digital tour. This shows us how new technologies are helping us to strengthen safety and make visits like this more accessible. But of course, this year, always safe has meant above everything else, always healthy. I'm very proud of the way in which we've worked with our suppliers around the world to protect our people. Tracing, testing and isolation is hard enough onshore. It's much harder offshore. But joint efforts between Equinor and our suppliers have helped us to continue to run our offshore operations around the world safely and healthily. When the pandemic began this year, we took a risk-based response to respond. At times, we reduced our activity to safeguard people, implementing robust mitigations and new processes. Those have allowed us to get through the worst of the pandemic so far. But as we continuously adapt and respond to the changing COVID-19 picture, we know that working with you is going to be paramount to the safety of all of our people and to the efficiency of our operations. 
Thank you for everything you're doing to make that possible. So we've started with always safe, indeed always healthy. I'd like now to go on to high value and low carbon. And these two things come together more and more. There are three areas I'd like to focus on. The first is what this means for our oil and gas operations in Norway and globally. The second is what it means for our growth in renewables. And the third is what it means for new technologies and low carbon solutions. Let me start with oil and gas in Norway and beyond. I should start by saying the world still needs oil and gas. Sometimes when you read newspapers and digital magazines, you can forget that. Indeed, the world will need oil and gas for a very, very long time to come. And we have a responsibility to produce that in the right way. I'll talk about our approach in both Norway and abroad. I'll start with Norway. And I think we should acknowledge how fortunate we are to have witnessed the response that the Norwegian government working together with industry has had to the challenges we face. Indeed, I would claim that response has been the best, bar none, in the world. There have been two particularly impactful proposals. The first was around upholding upstream activity through the changes announced by the Norwegian government to the petroleum tax regime, which has ensured the liquidity of many of our companies. The second has been a green stimulus package, totaling 3.6 billion NOC in grants to low carbon energy solutions, with a confirmed amount going forward to October's state budget. This combination has meant that we in the NCS will place a greater pro focus on projects going forward. And indeed, over the next few years, we will place our largest focus on projects in the NCS. We will continue to focus on international projects, but that will be in the slightly longer term. Value growth with lower carbon is absolutely key. To achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, the world needs energy providers that can deliver with less emissions, and it needs that rapidly. World energy demand continues to rise, and we'll still have a significant need for energy demand, and for oil and gas in particular, for the foreseeable future but not all barrels are created equal. And it's really important that the oil which is produced and the gas which is produced is produced as cleanly as possible. Norway is key to that. In Norway, we will maintain our focus on lowering the intensity of our oil and gas operations to ensure emission reductions. With your support, securing our position as an industry leader, we will reduce our absolute emissions from our operations by 40% in 2030 and reaching near zero in 2050. Our 2030 ambition translates into reductions of more than 5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. And to reach it, we plan to invest around 50 billion NOC together with our partners. A real breakthrough in reducing emissions has been the startup of the Johann Sverdrup field in the North Sea which I know that Gaia and Anna Sigva are particularly proud of. It's powered from shore, which means that the field has one of the lowest carbon dioxide emissions in the world, 0 0.67 kilograms of carbon dioxide per barrel compared to a global average of more than 18 kilograms. It's remarkable. Acker Solutions, Abel, Caverna, All Seas, Herma, NKT have been key partners in making this technological triumph possible. Now I'd like to look beyond Norway, where systematically we will plan at a global level to reduce our carbon emissions in line with the Paris agreements. We'll achieve this ambition by continuing to focus on abatement measures similar to those I've just described in Norway, such as enhancing energy efficiency, fuel switching, and extending the use of electricity to eliminate emissions from gas fuel turbines, compressors, and generators. A nice example of this is on the Peregrino field, a long way from Norway, down in Brazil, where we're changing power generation on the plant from diesel to natural gas. Once phase two of Peregrino is online, this will reduce emissions by 100,000 tonnes a year. We're also exploring digital solutions to reduce or prevent emissions from oil and gas extraction and production. Now, this is an area we need to work really closely with our suppliers and something we'll be looking at very carefully going forward. I'm sure that Arna Sigva and Gaia We'll get back to this topic later in the day. So if I've talked about oil and gas, first of all, I now want to move on to renewables. 
In this area, the market is changing and growing at an unprecedented pace. In fact, during COVID, renewable energy was the only energy source to actually grow. But it goes back further than that. Since the beginning of the decade, since the beginning of the decade, power from wind has increased sixfold. And as it has grown, so its cost has fallen. For example, in the UK where I'm sitting today, the UK government had to offer substantial guaranteed electricity prices, over 100 pounds per megawatt hour back in 2010. But today, wind farms such as Dogger Bank can compete head on with fossil fuels at far, far lower prices. This industry is also being seen as a pathway to ensuring a green recovery as we come out of the COVID pandemic. I'm sure you'll have seen that our incoming CEO, Anders Oppedal, is very clear that we will keep looking for profitable renewable projects around the world and will be accelerating our investments in this segment. The track record from our operations and our recent farm downs and our recent deals are really good proof points that our business model works in this area as well as it's been working for many decades in oil and gas. Over the past year we've done a couple of renewable deals that I really want to highlight to you. The first one was in Germany on our Arcona wind farm where we farmed down half of our share for 500 million euros and the second one you might have seen just last week where we farmed down half of our share in the United States to BP for 1.1 billion US dollars. That shows the sheer value we've been able to create with a renewables business. We see great opportunities to work with you and to cooperate with new and existing suppliers as we grow in this area. In short, we want you to come on this journey with us. Our current ambition is to reach 12 to 16 gigawatts over the next 15 years in renewable energy. But within the next six years only, we aim to grow by four to six gigawatts, around 10 times our current level at an average growth rate every year of 30%. The four to six gigawatt ambition in 2026 is based on projects which we already see. We have them in the pipeline. Dogger Bank you might be familiar with. Empire Wind is one of those projects in the US. We have Baltuk 1, Baltuk 2 and Baltuk 3 in Poland and High Wind Tampen closer to home in Norway. We're already working together with Skatec on solar power in addition. And in the longer term, we also have an exciting series of projects going beyond Europe and the United States and across to Asia. We see great opportunities beyond these and beyond our current fixed wind offshore wind projects for floating wind. It's an area of technology we're really proud of. This will be particularly important in areas where the seabed is too deep for, for fixed wind, such as California, Japan and South Korea. We believe that up to 80% of the world's wind resources will actually require floating wind in the future. So there's a really exciting potential there. We know we need to work with great suppliers in order to realize that potential. So we'll be looking to develop new supply chains and also recognizing that there can be a lot of crossover between our existing oil and gas supply chain and our new renewable supply chain. And that area of crossover is something equally important as I come on to our third area which is new technologies and low carbon solutions. We're really proud that today as we speak, we have a carbon advantage over our competitors. That is really important for our consumers and there's nowhere it's more important than in our consumers of gas in Europe. If Europe needs gas, it can obtain it from Norway and from Equinor at just 20% of the emissions of other piped gas and LNG sources even when you include all the emissions that come from transportation and distribution. That's remarkable. If you want to burn gas and you need to burn gas, burn Norwegian gas, it takes only 20% of the emissions to produce of other sources of gas. It's remarkable and we should be proud of it. And we believe our customers will increasingly care about it, not just in Europe, but well beyond. We believe that carbon capture and storage and hydrogen will also play a very important role beyond this, not just in meeting our climate ambitions, but also in underpinning the longevity of the whole oil and gas industry, which as we know is a huge source for the world of economic output and employment. And I'd now like to talk a little bit about carbon capture and storage. I'd like to start in Norway, where together with our partners Shell and Total, we're building a European carbon dioxide value chain for the first time. 
The Northern Lights project is Europe's first commercial scale carbon transportation and storage project. What it does is it ships carbon dioxide captured from industrial sources, first in Norway, but then in other sources across Northwest Europe to an onshore terminal on the west coast of Norway. From there, the liquefied carbon dioxide will be transported by pipeline to an offshore storage location subsea in the North Sea for permanent and safe storage. We more than anyone know how to do that. Together with our partners, we took a final investment decision back in May and the project received state aid clearance over the summer. We expect phase one of the transportation, injection and storage of 1.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide to be operational by 2024. Currently, the cheapest way of making hydrogen, clean hydrogen at least, is by converting it from natural gas. And that's the area I'd like to go on to next. What we can do is we can convert natural gas into clean hydrogen by capturing and storing the carbon dioxide that's left over. This so-called blue hydrogen can then be used in place of natural gas in power stations, refineries, chemical plants, furnaces and kilns, eliminating 95% of traditional emissions. We've been storing carbon dioxide safely under the rocks of the North Sea for decades in fields like Sleipner and Snurvit. So we're ready to put together two technologies, hydrogen on the one hand and carbon capture on the other hand, for a successful solution. We're involved in several blue hydrogen projects around the world. And one of those I'd like to focus on is here in the UK, where we're working on the Hydrogen to Humber Salt End project. This will be one of the world's largest and one of the world's first large scale blue hydrogen production plants with carbon capture. With supportive UK policy, we're targeting the first phase to be online by 2026, leading to emissions reductions of 900,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. By developing hydrogen infrastructure and markets, we also pave the way for a new form of hydrogen, so-called carbon-free green hydrogen. But we need to be open about the challenges. Blue hydrogen made from natural gas currently costs around about twice as much as natural gas. Green hydrogen made by electrolyzing water with renewable power costs around four times as much as natural gas. But we can be confident that over time, these costs will come down. Our success with wind power has shown just that. If governments can put in place incentives to develop new industries, then those industries can shed the need for government support over time. That's what makes us so confident about the long-term future for gas and oil paired with carbon capture and storage. So to conclude, I hope that I've managed to convince you that we as an industry have a long and exciting future together. There are still a lot of uncertainties related to the short term around the coronavirus, the pandemic and the lockdown, let alone the long term as we fully recover. As always, but particularly this year, keeping people safe and healthy has been the key priority for us. As we emerge from lockdown and with fewer restrictions, we do believe the world's energy demand will be picking up again. But one thing we cannot forget about is our need to produce this energy with fewer emissions and to deliver upon the Paris goals and the well below two degrees scenario. Our industry is at the core of this task and we need to do what we can to develop new solutions and technologies that will deliver energy with the lowest carbon footprint possible. I would argue at times like these, times of uncertainty, two things are really important. Our strategy has proven resilience and we've stressed the importance of working together. Over the next five to 10 years, the most important thing to do will be to set a direction with confidence. This five to 10 year period will arguably be the most important period, the most important decade in the history of our industry. We need to make sure we set the right direction and avoid the wrong direction. The key to all of this is collaboration. I've outlined three areas, oil and gas, renewables, and low carbon solutions where I believe we can work together. I'm sure there are many more, and I want to invite you to work with us to accelerate the energy transition and to provide the world with the energy it needs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Al, and I hope you all were inspired of the very exciting high value and low carbon opportunities we are right in the middle of. 
extremely important topics for us going forward. And our next speaker is Arne Sigve Nielen. Arne Sigve has been the Executive Vice President of Development and, no and Production in Norway since 2014. Before this, he served as a Senior Vice President of uh, Processing and Manufacturing for Marketing, Processing and Renewables Energy. Arne Sigve joined Equinor in 1987 and has a background from a range of operational and leadership positions. So Arne Sigve, please, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Peggy, and uh, hello everyone. It's uh, tempting to say good to see you all, but I can't, so at least it's good that we can meet uh, in this manner and uh, though virtually. Um, I would like to start by thanking you for the important job you do, all of you. As an operator, we see every day how dependent we are on your ability to deliver safely, on time, with the right quality and a competitive price level. The past half year has been very challenging, not least for many of you. And I must say I'm impressed by how you uh, or our industry and, and not you, uh, not least you, how you dealt with this situation and how we dealt with it together. We have pulled in the same direction with a common goal to keep our people safe and healthy and to maintain safe and stable operations and activities. And for your information, since March, we have transported over 75,000 passengers to our installations on the NCS. We have had no cases of COVID-19 on our operated assets, but a few cases onshore and uh, on some rigs and, and vessels. So again, thank you so much for your efforts. Always safe is our first priority and the first sentence in our strategy, which Al just presented. Our goal every day is to prevent major accidents and to ensure everyone will return home safely. To succeed, our collaboration is crucial. Therefore, I welcome the IOGP life-saving rules. They give us a common standard and a safety language across the industry. On the Norwegian continental shelf, we have also developed quarterly HSE learning packages that I know that many of you are using actively. And um, these have been developed in collaboration with suppliers and operators like Arca BP and Vo Energy. The objective is to strengthen safety and to be more consistent and predictable. This quarter, falling object is the main topic, and uh, we all know that energy from falling objects can be fatal. So, therefore, it's crucial that we always work safely in heights, secure our equipment, and stay clear uh, of the line of fire. I welcome you all um, that you give your reflections on our safety work and how you see you can contribute and how we can collaborate even stronger to even make our safety levels stronger. The energy landscape is undergoing huge transition and as Al mentioned, Equinor is becoming a broad energy company. You can literally, literally see it happening on the NCS as we speak. And um, you often heard that um, we say that the NCS will be the backbone of Equinor for many years. This statement is still valid and we strongly believe on the opportunities um, in this province. Two years ago, we launched a revitalized roadmap for the NCS with the ambition to transform the Norwegian continental shelf to deliver sustainable values for decades. I think this ambition still responds well to the challenges as we as an industry are facing. And one thing is certain, I think, this, this is only possible through strong collaboration with you and our partners. So therefore, let me take you through some of the strategic challenges I, I invite you to solve together with us as we move along this extremely challenging, but also very exciting journey. 
The first is the reserve and resource replenishment. And there are still substantial remaining oil and gas resources on the NCS. The, we maintain our ambition to drill 20 to 30 exploration wells annually. And despite the challenging situation with the COVID-19 and due to the close collaboration with not least you as suppliers, we are drilling around 20 exploration wells this year. We do, however, not expect, but, but still hope to find many fields at the size of Iwan Sveldrup. Uh, but I think new discoveries will most likely be smaller and more challenging to extract. So we need to utilize the existing infrastructure and actively explore for oil and gas in the proximity of our installations. And um, in line with our, our ambitions, we are continuing our efforts to extend lifetime of our uh, of over 20 installation and to deliver on this challenge, we need innovation and new ways of working and a push on digitalization. The second challenge was covered very well by Al, but it is the climate challenge, which is very high on the agenda worldwide. And um, the industry plays a very important role on the path towards a low carbon future. In January, Equinor, together with a broad alliance of industry players and unions, launched the ambition mentioned by L by 40% reduction in 2030 and near zero emissions by 2050 from the Norwegian oil and gas sector. And this is extremely ambitious. Trends, if we are building, we are building a new value chain and uh, we are well underway with large scale industrial measures, including energy efficiency, electrification projects, digitalization, and, and more. And there are many examples on the NCS. Johan Svertrup has been mentioned with power from Shure, Sleipner Field will be partly electrified, and Gina Krog will be fully electrified. The floating wind project, Hyven Tumpen, coming on stream in 2022 will provide power to the snow and Gulfax fields. And this year we made an historic investment decision mentioned by Al transporting and storage of CO2 together with our partners Shell and Total, the Norwegian uh, the Northern Lights project. And um, I think this is a unique solution and enable handling of large CO2 volumes in the future. But we also depend on smaller scale everyday efforts to improve energy efficiency, and I welcome you to contribute and challenges or, or challenge us on this very important issue. Innovation is key in solving the climate issue, but also operating more safe and more efficiently. So let me share some good examples with you. Last month, Together with Nordic Unmanned, we carried out the world's first logistic operation with a drone flying from onshore to an offshore installation. The drone flew a 3D printed part from the Mongstar base, supply base, about 80 kilometers to the Troll A platform in the North Sea. And it landed just beautifully on the helideck. So going from flying drones to subsea drones, an open standard docking station for subsea vehicles won this year's ONS Innovation Award for small and medium enterprises. The solution is developed by Blue Logic and Equinor, and it will enable any type of subsea vehicle to dock, recharge, and download data and it can also be used by all in the industry. And I think that drones are just one example of how new and innovative solution can contribute to lower CO2 emissions, and at the same time, improve safety, increase production efficiency, and not least, reduce cost. The third challenge I invite you to solve together with us is competitiveness. The challenging market situation we have seen the past half year 
clearly illustrates the need to be competitive at all times. This spring, a majority at the Norwegian Parliament approved temporary adjustments to the petroleum tax regime. And the objective with this is to maintain activity, secure value creation, and increase emission cuts during a very challenging period. I think it's highly appreciated by our, our industry and uh, the responsibility rests with us to develop robust projects. And again, we depend on you to, to achieve this. One of the biggest challenges related to competitiveness on the NCS is due to many mature fields and, and aging installations. Equinor's ambition is to become a leading operator of late life uh, fields on the NCS. So, so therefore in April this year, we established a new late life unit, the field life extension or an abbreviation of FLX. We think there is a great potential in new ways of working to develop and produce oil and gas from mature fields in a profitable way. And what can suit better than the statue field to really work on this scenario to make this initiative come a reality? The statue A platform was scheduled for decommissioning in 2022. Now we're extending the life of this uh, installation to 2027 and for Statue B and C beyond 2035. So the plan is to drill around 100 new wells towards 2030 and considerable investments and upgrading of the platforms will also be made in this period. The final challenge I would like to present to you and address to you is the industrial understanding and support. We need to work even more closely together on this. I think it's vital that we invite for dialogue and are open and listen when the future of our industry is debated. I appeal to all of you to find ways to demonstrate that we we deserve our place and how we are making our industry fit for the future. I'm certain that the competence and the experience developed in our industry will drive value creation for decades to come, both within the energy sector and beyond. So all in all, it depends on us. So my challenge to you today is that you all bring forward improvement ideas, challenge us to find new ways of working and be bold in applying new technology. And I think that's how we improve and make progress for, the, for this industry. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Anna Sigve. Uh, some years ago, some people predicted sunset over the NCS, and you can really see that this is definitely not true. Very interesting to see all of this happening. Our next speaker is our Executive Vice President for Technology Project and Drilling, Geir Tungesvik. Uh, Geir joined Equinor in 1985. He comes from the position as a senior vice president of project development. And before that, he was a senior vice president of drilling and well. And he has had several central management positions in the company. But before Gail gets the word, we will show a video of this year's project highlights. And I'm so proud of showing this to you. Please start the movie. <laughs>
Thank you, Peggy. I am impressed of what we have achieved together so far this year, despite the pandemic. We could not have done this without you. Thank you very much. To succeed with projects together, we also must succeed with safety together. We all have a responsibility that all people that work for us can come home safely. Working safely provides the basic for delivering a world-class project portfolio. And I see stronger collaboration within safety today, both between different yards and construction companies, but also between vessels and vessel owners. We still have incidents, but the overall trend is pointing in the right direction. Let us continue and even improve the good collaboration. We do have a large project portfolio, both in execution and with opportunities. Today, Equinor have 25 projects in execution with a total value of about 34 billion US dollars, engaging nearly 35,000 people all over the world. COVID-19 and reduction in commodity prices has hit us hard, but we are still aiming for counter cyclical investments. And unfortunately, there is no UN felt at this time. So we are in a way forced into a diet, opportunity for a lifestyle change. I would like to highlight a few achievements this year for our execution projects. Peregrino Phase 2 was installed this January offshore Brazil. The hookup is well underway, underway but it has been hampered by the COVID-19 situation. We accept, expect startup next year. The Snorra expansion project 
topside module and subsea equipment was installed this year. Good cooperation between the project, our suppliers and Norwegian authorities made it possible to install the topside module during the first wave of COVID-19 in Norway. Troll phase three project. We recently installed the new process module on Troll A. And earlier this spring, we installed the pipeline connecting the new templates to Troll A. And the Johan Kasberg, we have had a very busy marine season in the Barents Sea with a lot of subsea installations. And the FBS Ohal is under construction in Singapore, 80% completed. Hive in Tampen, the plan for development and operations is approved. And we have taken an investment decision on partly electrifying the Sleipner field. And as you have heard, the Northern, Light, Northern Lights project Investment, investment decision and PDO is delivered, and we are awaiting the formal authorities' approval. But we also have a pre sanctioned portfolio. The future projects portfolio is even bigger, and there are more than 30 projects pre sanctioned with a value of 70 to 80 billion US dollars. And as you can see, it covers everything from offshore wind developments to subsea tiebacks, from carbon capture and storage to floating production storage and offloading projects. On the Norwegian continental shelf, there's a widespread portfolio recognized by tiebacks and unmanned field developments, and Krafla and Pion is fields where we think the unmanned production platform will be our first uh, selection. We also see large field development as Breidablik and Visting and power from shore projects. Internationally, we have matured several uh, large oil and gas developments. Baydenor in Canada, Rosebank in UK, and Bacalao and BMC 33 in deep water Brazil. All our developments work to reduce carbon footprints. Renew renewable projects are also large. Wind project as Empire Wind in the US, Baltic in Poland, and hydrogen project in UK. And to be able to sanction these projects in the future, we need to develop our pre-sanctioned projects together with you. And the margins in these projects will not survive negative surprises. To sanction any new projects, they need to be matured and fully understood by all parties. And therefore we need you, we need your help to rapid implementation of cost-efficient and value-creating technologies, take out even more of the potential within digitalization, and use standard solution and equipment. And we have been eager to make standardization across the industry. On the Norwegian continental shelf, we have something called NCS 2017 plus for subsea production systems to be used not only by Equinor, but the whole industry. The YIP 33 is equipment for the top side, where all major companies together have given you predictability and common agreement on equipment specifications. I think that if we can provide you with predictability, I think that will help you to be able to prepare and get your margins on your part of the business. Competitiveness is also about climate and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency 
in all projects. Using technology to reduce cost, reduce carbon footprint and increase production. Let me mention some few of the projects in our portfolio. Breda Blick is a large oil discovery. In fact, I think the largest remaining undeveloped discovery in the Norwegian continental shelf. It's located northeast of the Granefield in the North Sea. And Breda Blick will be developed as a subsea field with tieback to the Grane platform. 23 new wells will be drilled and a receiving unit will be installed at the Grane platform. We plan for an investment decision later this year. Bacalao, FPSO for the Santon Basin, deep water in Brazil. Front end engineering design is ongoing, designed and developed by Modec, who has a long experience by building FPSO for the Brazilian water. The subsea development will be performed by Subsea Integration Alliance. And then if you go back to Norway, we had Wisting, a standalone subsea development in the Barn Sea, still looking into concept alternatives with a prognosed investment decision in 2022. And as mentioned by several, Hyven Tampen, a pioneer project on the Norwegian continental shelf. The Snorre and the Gullfax platform will be the first platforms in the world to receive power from a floating offshore wind farm consisting of 11 wind turbines, and it will reduce the CO2 emission by more than 200,000 tons per year. All of this we need to develop together with you. We need to work together to be successful. And that is something Peggy, our Chief Procurement Officer, will talk more about. How we can succeed together. So Peggy, I now give the word back to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Gaia. So despite the challenging context, uh, Equinor's ambitions remain high and our strategy and journey towards becoming a broad energy company remains firm. Always safe, high value and low carbon. To continue delivering on this journey, the only way that Equinor can succeed is together with suppliers. We worked, as Al said, with more than 9,000 direct suppliers. And if you also include the whole supply chain, this number can be multiplied several times. But becoming a supplier to us also comes with a set of expectations. And I want to talk a bit more about these expectations in three pillars. So now you must pay close attention if you want to stay as or become a supplier to Equinor. First and foremost, we expect safe and sustainable deliveries. You have heard it several times today. Always safe is our first priority. Our goal is that everyone that works for us shall return home safely. And so far this year, we have had more than 300 injuries in our business, and most of them are suppliers, and that is not good enough. So thus it is important to us that we prevent major accident, personal injuries and falling objects, ensure safe work at heights, and provide good health and working environment, as Anna Sigve showed you. It's important that you, together with us, ensure a forceful implementation of the industry standard life-saving rules. Together we can improve and develop a strong check and act culture. I am safety and I need you to be that as well. Since the pandemic hit us, we have put significant effort into minimizing the consequences of the COVID-19 outbreak for Equinor and the supplier industry. Our primary goal has been to ensure people's safety, maintain safe operations and to keep our activities going, keep up production, drill wells and ensure prog progress in our projects. We would like to take this opportunity to complement all of our suppliers' efforts to this. You have done a tremendous job in helping us to achieve this goal, keeping people safe 
and production and drilling running. And we have actually had no disruption in supply of equipment in this period, and that is quite a job. I would also like the opportunity to, to use this opportunity to remind you of Equinor's COVID-19 guidelines, which is continuously updated at our supplier pages at equinor.com. So please pay close attention to this. But in certain times like now, it's particularly important to continue having an open and trust-based collaboration. Being strongly guided by, by our values and ensuring business integrity are more important than ever. We know that the risk for business integrity breaches in a situation like this. This, it increases. So that could be fraud, it could be cybersecurity incidents, corruption and violation of human rights. Ethical conduct is essential for sustainable business. And for Equinor, ethics is an integrated part of our activities. We expect high ethical standards from everyone who acts on our behalf. We have zero tolerance for bribery and corruption in any form, and that includes facility payment. And we take active steps to ensure that bribery or corruption does not occur in our business activities. We have experienced examples of business integrity breaches, such as fake invoices, fraudulent purchase orders, and price lists. And we have heard about employees being pressured to pay bribes to avoid quarantines. We also see that cybersecurity risks where scammers are taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation with phishing emails and other forms of fraud. And this is not acceptable. It's important that we face these challenges together. We all need to be aware of uh, the human rights risks, that, that those are increased in this period. In a situation like the pandemic, many workers are being laid off and lose their family incomes. Other workers can experience sharp and temporary increase in demand and leading to extensive, excessive working hours. And some workers might accept working um, uh, working conditions below standards to get uh, income for their families. Respecting human rights is fundamental to Equinor and essential to a license to operate. And already in year 2000, we were one of the first companies in the world signing up for the United Nations Global Compact Principles. In 2005, we included the supplier declaration in the contracts where suppliers confirm their commitment to human rights. In 2015, we published our human rights policy, committing to, to conduct our business consistently with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And last year, we spelled that out in more details in our human rights expectation to suppliers. And you can find these on equinor.com. We all need to evaluate the risk for workers check if our suppliers are responding suitably, keep an open dialogue and act if adequate measures have not been taken. And finally, on safety and sustainability, we have no planet B. As clearly stated today, Equinor will accelerate our contribution to the energy and low carbon transition, and we are committed to the Paris Agreement. Despite the ongoing crisis, we are on track on delivering on carbon neutral solutions by 2030. We are still aiming for less than eight kilo CO2 per barrel emission intensity from our operations by 2025, which is less than industry average. The second pillar where we need to succeed together is ensuring a profitable industry. Equinor is becoming a broader energy company and the ability to deliver on strategy goal is heavily dependent on suppliers' contribution in the supply chain, across the supply chain, globally and locally. Given the potential impacts emerging from this crisis, we are continuously monitoring our core segments like rigs, drilling and well services, construction, subsea, maintenance and modifications. Our market approach will be adapted to secure a competitive access to capacity, competence, and technology. And moving towards a lower margin environment, we continuously need to increase efficiency and reduce costs. Cost focus is essential. And one of the implications for Equinor is to look at what we buy and how we buy it. 
We believe in creating value with suppliers. We believe in creating win-win solutions, reducing both cost, cost for both parties in, and mutually finding a beneficial opportunities. Together with many suppliers, we will explore new ways of working to reduce cost for both parties. We expect you as suppliers to proactively investigate cost reduction and no efficiency gain is to consider too small. We must find a sustainable price level, both to us and the supply chain. And as of now, we will not uh, initiate renegotiations across the entire portfolio. We are not just focusing on Equinor in this, because we are fully dependent on a sustainable and competitive supplier industry. The third and final pillar is related to radical improvements. Our industry has historically been pushing the limit of what is possible. Digital at scale, remote, unmanned and innovation are key elements. One example is the use of online inspection, replacing physical presence, which you saw in the Mariner installation with a digital visit we had in a safety moment. Another example is the use of Teams. Uh, to illustrate, Microsoft reported that uh, Italy uh, which was strongly affected by the COVID-19, had a 775% increase every month in team users in the early phases of the pandemic. And uh, in Equinor, few people used teams actively before this crisis, and now it's the new normal. I actually heard that we learned digitally in eight weeks in the beginning of the pandemic, what would normally have taken us five years. Yet another example, a few years ago, we were really proud of the Osterhans then, weighing around 60,000 tons. And we are still proud of Osterhans then, but now Geir is talking much more about unmanned installations like Oseberg Westflaggen, weighing 5,000 tons. And as Arne Sigve showed, we are testing the use of robotics, for example, aerial drones for transport and underwater drones for mon monitoring and maintenance. And we also work on artificial intelligence for predictive maintenance, smart sensors for condition monitoring and advanced analytics, digital twins, for example, used for maintenance, planning and training, and smart contracts using blockchain. We expect several examples like this happening faster and with more impact. And this will enable new opportunities for both suppliers and for Equinor to develop and produce energy in a much more efficient way. Without it, we may face stranded assets, less business opportunities and actually being outcompeted. So we need to transform the way we work and collaborate to produce affordable energy for the world. We are following the market closely, maintaining a good dialogue with our suppliers and truly appreciate the good collaboration that we have with you. It's no doubt that the industry will look different after this crisis we will not be able to go back to the normal that we had. And to, however, we have in this situation created win-win uh, solutions that will be more important than ever. We learned from the previous recession. In collaboration with suppliers, we did a good job enabling uh, us to maintain activity, sanction projects, award contracts and secure employment for our industry. And these learnings make us better prepared for handling the current situation. We must pursue the good work that was done during the last past years to get through yet another crisis together. This is a challenge in joint context and succeeding together is actually the only way to succeed. And speaking of succeeding together, now is the time to give the word to two of our most important suppliers and I'm really looking forward to their speeches. First of all, uh, we will hear from uh, Baker Hughes and then Uvam Ukpom. Uvam is Executive Vice President for Region Alliances Enterprises Sale for Baker Hughes. In his role, he has responded for in, uh, identifying, has responsible for identifying and realizing growth opportunities. A 27 year industry veteran, Uvam has directly managed global oil and gas operation across North America, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and Latin America. 
he has had multiple oil field services throughout his career, including petrophysicist and reservoir engineer. So please, Uwe, the stage is yours. Peggy, thank you so very much. And I sincerely want to thank Equinor for this invitation to speak today. As the previous speakers have said, we are definitely in unprecedented times. And as a result, collaboration has become absolutely key in our industry for us to collectively come together and work together towards advancing the industry and overcoming the challenges that we face today. And so obviously health, safety, environment, compliance and quality are key responsibilities of us as suppliers as we work with our key customer like Equinor. I sincerely want to thank also Equinor and the Norwegian Oil and Gas Authority in the way COVID has been managed. We as an organization have worked very hard to ensure the safety of our employees, but more importantly also drive how we ensure business continuity for the activities and the way we serve Equinor. And all of that has come with a lot of fantastic learnings which we have deployed to a lot of our other operations around the world. A little bit about Baker Hughes, uh, a company of 60,000 employees operating in over 120 countries around the world. And we play in the oil and gas, but at the same time, we also play in the renewable space. And so we call ourselves an energy technology company. And what has been interesting with this pandemic is the way we have seen the acceleration of digital within our organization. As Peggy mentioned, internally, we've learned to use teams uh, to be able to work together. We are now having this event as a virtual event. But from an operation standpoint, we have accelerated the way we do remote operations. Uh, remote operations from a drilling perspective around automated drilling operations, where we've been able to reduce by 50% the number of employees we send out to rigs and platforms, specifically in Norway. Again, Equinor has been a pioneer in this new way and approach to working, and we have used this opportunity to deploy to other countries around the world. Now, I used the word automated here, which takes drilling to another level where we are looking at minimal or no intervention as we drill a whole section, thereby driving efficiency and helping to reduce the cost in the way we drill our wells today. So we continue to expand this remote operations, but it's not just only within drilling. Our subsea operations, where we're doing integrity monitoring or operational diagnostics, are also applying remote operations using cloud-enabled video solutions. We are also looking to drive this even around the turbines and the compressors that we monitor around the world, 1,400 to be precise. And that's where we start to bring the power of digital above and beyond remote operations. And that takes me to the next slide where we start to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning and the value it brings to the industry. I'd like to uh, let our audience know that last year, Becky Hughes entered into an alliance with a company called C3.AI in California, where we now are actively involved in AI and machine learning, but AI and machine learning at scale. And what that has helped us do is take AI and machine learning from just physics-based models to now being able to ingest data to be able to find and develop 
more insights as we see in the industry today, all towards driving efficiency. So as Peggy mentioned, activities around reliability, predictive maintenance, yield optimization, energy management uh, when it comes to low carbon solutions are some of the areas where we are beginning to drive artificial lift and machine learning. We're also proud to say that we are partnering with Equinor on the blockchain initiative where we're going to be looking at smart contracting and being able to connect, connect the operations process from invoicing all the way to the way the contract is executed and that connectivity. So a lot of activity in this space. I would even stretch it one more to say in the area of drilling around drilling hazards prevention, which helps in the reduction of non-productive time or NPT, we are also working and piloting or looking to pilot with Equinor and still at early stages of the development of a drilling hazards performance type application to be deployed in Norway, the first of its kind for us based on our artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. So from that perspective, innovation at the industrial edge is absolutely key to our industry. Our digital solution technologies that will be helping provide vibration monitoring, health of the machines uh, from the edge are gonna be very key applications that we are gonna be driving around the area of digital transformation in the, in the industry. And as, as always, I say, I'm super pleased with the openness of Equinor for us to try some of the solutions as we move ahead. Our previous speakers have spoken about what we call the dual energy challenge in low carbon, which means being able to continue to produce oil and gas, but at a low carbon point. And my next slide will speak to some of the things that we are looking to do as an industry together with Equinor and our other partners around us. Now, first of all, Baker Hughes as a company has joined in this energy transition journey and we have also made our own commitment to be able to reduce our own carbon emissions 50% by the year 2030 and get to net zero emissions in the year 2050. Our baseline is from 2012 and year to date, we have been able to reduce by 31%. Now this is no easy feat and it means that we as an industry and as an organization would need to continue to drive and look for areas where we can achieve this. And that's why when we look at our low carbon energy solutions, we are working very closely with our partners to look to see how we can decarbonize their operations. Some of the notable areas are what I am shown on the screen here, where in our land operations around methane monitoring, which is a major source of carbon emissions, we are bringing and introducing into the industry with active participation with our customers, abilities to be able to monitor methane emissions. Uh, efficient power generation is absolutely a key area. And I'm proud to say that in our work, we are doing with Equinor in Brazil, specifically Bacalhau, we have introduced technology around combined cycle uh, energy emissions. Uh, Combined cycle technology is all around taking the excess or the waste heat from the turbines and converting that to additional power to be able to deploy in the operation. Here through this process, we are helping Equinor significantly decarbonize its operations in Brazil, and we look forward to doing more of this. Now, some may see Baker Hughes as purely an oil and gas company, but I'm also proud to say that within the renewable space, our digital solutions technologies and some of our censoring technologies around conditioning monitoring are deployed on wind turbines. Uh, 
Specifically, we have 35,000 monitors or sensors deployed on wind turbines around the world. And we look to expand and continue to play in this industry as we move forward. I do believe there is a challenge to us in the industry to be able to continue to produce oil and gas, but at the same time to produce oil and gas with a conscience to decarbonize our production. And that's what I refer to as the dual energy challenge. Baker Hughes as a company will continue to be focused in this regard. We continue to drive a sustainability framework focused around the planet, our people and principles. We continue to work in an ethical matter, manner with full integrity. We believe very much in an ethical supply chain. Diversity and inclusion in the workplace is absolutely key. And I always sincerely thank Equinor because in our performance reviews, these are topics that come up as to how we are performing, including areas around human rights, uh, which was mentioned earlier on. So I want to say, as Becky Hughes, we see Equinor as a strong partner. We thank Equinor for allowing us to deploy new technology in the industry to help drive efficiency and to help decarbonize the oil and gas industry. We look forward to greater partnerships and we will continue to drive all of this in itself in a safety, healthy and efficient manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Uwen, for that engaging speech and touching upon uh, diversity, inclusion uh, and business integrity. Human rights is really that's the way we want uh, uh, our suppliers to work. And also what you talk about with digitalization and, and technology transformation, like the combined cycle technology at Bacalhau, this is really in the core of what our industry re needs right now. Now it's the time for our next and final speaker before the Q&A. Uh, it's uh, CEO of ABLE, uh, Mats Andersen. Mats has more than 30 years of experience from the oil and gas industry and had held uh, several positions uh, in Aqua Solutions, uh, Cameron International and one subsea, a Schlumberger company. And he is now the CEO for ABLE, as I said. And I have been that for almost four years. ABLE is one of our major suppliers, both within oil and gas and within the renewable segment. In his previous and current role, Mats has been responsible for many uh, deliveries uh, to various parts of Equinor, so, Mats, I know that you have some surprises for us. I'm looking, really looking forward to see and hear what you have for us today. Thank you, uh, Peggy, and uh, thanks for the kind invitation to uh, join you here today. I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this uh, important virtual event and also to have to, uh, the opportunity to talk about how we together have leveraged opportunities. Now, I know you don't know su like surprises usually, but uh, we're going to try to show you some uh, some of the stuff that we're doing with you uh, live today. But let me introduce uh, by saying that Abel is a privately owned Norwegian supplier uh, that build, modify and provide maintenance services to oil and gas infrastructure. But we have also established a solid position in the European offshore wind industry. Uh, and at the end of last year, more than one third of our backlog, 80 billion kroner backlog, was within this renewable energy segment. Uh, we have right now uh, around 4,000 skilled and dedicated employees that are working out of six offices in Norway and offices in Singapore and Thailand. And we own uh, and operate two world-class offshore construction yards, uh, one in Thailand and one in Haugesund here in Norway. But right now we engage more than 10,000 people in our project portfolio when we include contractors and uh, partners. We enable, we've had the pleasure of working with Equinor for decades and we have leveraged many joint opportunities over there, both within the green field and the brown field oil and gas segment. Our relationship was uh, expanded further at the end of last year uh, to also cover the offshore wind segment through a preferred supplier agreement with Equinor on the Doggerbank uh, Wind Farm Development Offshore UK. 
our senior engineers, they refer to the delivery of the QI, the Bjorn platform in 2003 as the first so-called EPC contract with Equinor. We're able to deliver turnkey project uh, comprising engineering, procurement, construction, everything under one contract. And we have then since then delivered major upgrades and uh, modifications to Troll, Sleipner, Statfjord and many other assets. And the complete platform deck for the Gudrun platform was delivered in uh, 2013. Uh, we also hold a long term frame agreement for uh, maintenance and modification services, and we are currently present on 14 Equinor operated platforms offshore and five of Equinor's uh, process plants onshore, uh, all the way from Hammerfest, uh, LNG in the north, to Korsta in the uh, southwest of Norway. And just to give you a flavor of what we're working on today together with Equinor, uh, we're currently finalizing the offshore work on the Snowder platform, where we have installed a 550 ton module, uh, which is a key component in Equinor's plans for increasing and prolonging production uh, from the Snowder field towards year uh, 2040. On the hydrogen platform, a three and a half thousand ton gas compression model is now being commissioned to take a production from the nearby Dval in the field. And we're also performing a full upgrade of the Neut Bravo FSU uh, vessel uh, that will extend the lifespan for this asset for another 20 years or so. And furthermore, we are the main contractor for the second onshore power from shore station at Haugsnes, the south of Haugesund, which will provide renewable power to Johan Sveidrup and many of the other production platforms around the Utsira height, and hence reduce the carbon emissions from these fields significantly, as you heard Al Cook and other talk about earlier today. Looking ahead, we have recently been awarded new contracts related to field electrification, both on Schleipner and Gina Krog, as Arne Sigve talked about, as well as studies and front-end engineering on Oseberg and uh, Hammerfest uh, LNG. But by far the single largest and most complex project that we have leveraged together with Equinor is the Johan Sveidrup field development. We uh, have built and delivered the drilling platform in June 2018, and we're right now uh, building the second processing platform. The upper process module of the P2 platform is currently being assembled in a North Sea hall at Hypersoon. The construction started November last year, and the time lapse video that you see now show you the construction up to end of last month. And as you can see, we are we're following the Lego principle, assembling uh, the platform piece by piece, module by module, and the completed platform will uh, be around 25,000 ton when it's finished and installed uh, offshore. Over the years, we have executed a very comprehensive joint improvement agenda together with Equinor. As many of the opportunities for improvements uh, have required efforts and involvement from both parties. The collaboration spans from industry-wide initiatives on safety that Guy uh, mentioned earlier, where we recently have set the common agenda and KPI targets towards year 2025. Other joint programs between Equinor and ABLE have addressed um, topics like engineering efficiency, uh, construction productivity, project execution methodology, supply chain management, and development of new solutions with reduced carbon emissions. One of the most exciting areas for innovation and improvement is using digitalization. And Equinor and ABLE, we have uh, jointly introduced many ways of collaborating using digital solutions. And right now we are assisting Equinor in their development of a so-called digital twin for Johan Sverdrup P2 platform. This is a technology that will simplify the operation and the maintenance of the platform in the future. The operator can uh, very quickly retrieve information and status on uh, equipment, instruments, valves, virtually anything, anywhere on the platform uh, in a matter of seconds. 
The digital twin now holds more than 100 gigabytes of data and will save time and money as well as improve safety and quality during production. The digital twin has also proved to be very helpful uh, during the construction of the platform. And by using AR or augmented reality, our technical staff can very efficiently inspect and quality control the building process. And here's the surprise, because I wanted to show you how we do this, uh, how we apply this technology live. And we will now try to connect to our North Sea Hall in Haugesund. And if technology serves us right, uh, you will now see Halvor Hansen, who is uh, one of our talented foremen. And he's going to demonstrate how he uses AR to see the status of the construction without using a single drawing on paper. And you can see him wearing what's known as a HoloLens that contains the 3D model with all of the drawings on the platform. And he can then superimpose this 3D model onto the real construction, compare them live anywhere on the platform. Let's see this in action now. And first, Halva, can you hear me? Hello, Mats. I can hear you loud and clear. And hello to everyone. And how are you today, Halva? Great. I'm really excited to show off our latest technology. I bet you are. Could you just start just by um, explaining how you use this technology? Yes. Right now, you see the real construction. When I look around, you see everything in real life. But I can easily go to this menu. Then I can put in whatever I like. I can put in structure. I can put in piping. And pipe support. Fantastic. And how, what would you say are the main advantages of using this technology? It's by comparing the image with the real construction. I and I can also see if anything is wrong or anything is missing. It's not installed, and I can also see the total picture. And while we're looking at some of these images that Halvor is projecting, I can add that the, the digital twin itself is a, is a very uh, good tool for cooperation between Able and Equinor during construction of the, uh, and the operation. And what are we seeing now, Halvor? Uh, right now, I found one, one structural later which is not installed. And it's easy for me to see with this uh, HoloLens. Is that, is that the blue piece that we're seeing? Yes, it's the blue piece. All right. Well, again, listen, Holloway, thank you so much for uh, for your time and uh, and a good demonstration on how you use this. And and don't forget to weld that blue piece back on, huh? With this technology, we won't forget anything. Our uh, relationship with Equinor has evolved over many years, and we enable have uh, gradually challenged with larger and more complex tasks and projects. And as mentioned earlier, we have been contracted to deliver to SSE and Equinor's Dogger Bank Offshore Wind Park, the world's largest offshore wind development so far. And together with our partners, Hitachi ABB Power Grid, and in close cooperation with Equinor, ABLE will deliver three so-called HVDC converter platforms that will collect, convert, and transform the power from several hundred uh, offshore windmills uh, onto the shore to power more than 4 million homes. The Dogger Bank project has many similarities with an oil and gas project. And without going into details, uh, it certainly serves as a great example on how the Norwegian oil and gas competence can be highly relevant in the European renewable energy sector. And our journey with, uh, with Equinor continues as we now Together, we'll embark on finding solutions for unmanned production platforms. First for the Carfa field, as you heard Guy talk about earlier, and we hope that these solutions may be competitive for other future developments in the North Sea. Our relation with, with Equinor has been built um, on a common foundation within the area of health, safety, security, and the environment, HSSSE, as well, as a mutual understanding of the importance of ethics and compliance and uh, similar corporate responsibilities. 
In addition, we need to deliver on the project ex execution basics, which is on time with the agreed quality and at a competitive cost. And when things do not go as planned, as you've seen today, and that does happen, then we strive to be very transparent and open in our communication so that the right actions can be taken jointly to minimize uh, any consequences. Our relationship was put on a test in mid-March when COVID-19 hit the country and our industry. But through close dialogue with Equinor and our own suppliers, we were able to agree actions, uh, set priorities without compromising health and safety. And I'm incredibly impressed with how our own employees and the industry as a whole has uh, managed the situation uh, so far. The past months have shown that even in unprecedented difficult times, we can find good solutions by working together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mats. Uh, that was a really inspiring 15 minutes, and we are very happy and proud to have both you and Uvem with us here today. And also, we went directly from the yard, even though we couldn't get the HoloLenses straight on. We had a we had a backup plan for that, so uh, uh, it was really exciting to see how that works. And you will continue to to be with us going forward because now it's the time for the Q and A session. And um, as I said in the beginning, due to the large number of participants, we were not able to have a live Q&A this time, but we have invited all of you to send in questions in advance. And in the session, uh, we will touch upon many topics uh, like COVID-19, opportunities for collaboration, how to ensure a profitable industry in a lower margin environment, new technology, the low carbon transition, and our project portfolio, to name a few. I'm very happy to have both Geir, Arne Sigve, Uvem and Mats with us, uh, with me here to answer all of your questions. I want to start by uh, asking a question related to the situation we're in with the ongoing, uh, ongoing pandemic. So Geir, uh, let's uh, start with you. What, what are your main learnings from the COVID-19 and what do you consider the new normal for your workforce? Thank you, Peggy. Um, I think COVID-19 forced us into a new situation. Um, when countries start to shut down, office location was not available anymore. Um, suddenly there were no travels, no offices, no face-to-face -face meetings. And it just impressed me how fast the industry found solution to mitigate the situation. It seems that when we must, we can change very fast and very forceful. And sometimes I wonder, what if other areas could, could we apply the same kind of pressure and see how fast we can change and take learning uh, with the same speed as we have this time? When it comes to my workforce, um, there will be less traveling and more virtual meetings and also virtual site visits and inspection as we already have shown both onshore and offshore. And I think working from home will be most likely a fully acceptable working situation for some people. And we will change and become a more flexible or agile organization. Uh, if I can follow up a bit on that, you touch upon flexibility, Geir, for example, Uvam, from a supplier perspective, how what what are your learning and how do you how do you consider the new the new normal and also being based in Houston? Thank you for Ross from our perspective. Uh, what we learned was really how to stay focused and you know staying focused around ensuring the safety of our people as i said we operate in over 120 countries and all of a sudden we found a number of our field service personnel trapped or stuck in remote locations where they could not fly out so that ability to stay focused continue to motivate the team and show to them as a company that you care was absolutely 
important. Uh, the second aspect of what we did was really then focused on ensuring business continuity for our customers. And, and there were a lot of good learnings uh, from a supply chain perspective, how we may need to think differently about our supply chains, our manufacturing, uh, where, where we position equipment, how we distribute suppliers around the world to ensure that we limit risk to be able to effectively move goods and services. Uh, that was one. Uh, the other interesting thing we learned uh, being pushed by COVID was we ramped up a lot of our additive manufacturing abilities. Uh, so the ability to 3D print spare parts and be able to quickly get them to our customers uh, was quite a fantastic learning coming out of this. Uh, Thank you, Raman. And I must say that um, uh, the way both you and Baker use that all of the suppliers have been working with the supply chain, as you mentioned, has been, as I also said in my speech, has been a tremendous effort. Uh, Italy are one of the countries where most of our valves comes from, for example, and was really hard hit hard by this pandemic and we didn't have any disruptions in the supply chain, as I said. So I think uh, thinking new and um, get, uh, getting the supply chain to work has been a, a very good effort. Uh, and talking about this um, uh, opportunities for collaboration, uh, Arne Sigve, what, what do you see as the main opportunities for collaboration in this uh, situation? Well, I think that uh, if, if we look at the history on the NCS, um, it was really developed through collaboration between operators, uh, partners and suppliers. So I think we can build on that going going forward, uh, uh, regardless of, of the pandemic and, and the situation we are just to build on, on this legacy, I think is, 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 is a value in itself. Um, and um, uh, I just briefly in my introduction mentioned the field life extension entity um, that really is a kind of um, entity that really will now nurture and develop um, collaboration further with having the suppliers working very closely with um, employees from, from Equinor. I think that is a, a good training ground to get, get even more uh, close collaboration going forward. Um, one area that we do not compete in is safety. Uh, I think that's the area where we will collaborate and should collaborate going f going forward. Um, I mentioned the initiatives that we have through the life saving rules, um, the annual wheel. And I also think that if we can coordinate initiatives throughout the industry, regardless of being an operator or supplier, I think we would be more predictable and our colleagues and employees will know how to act when moving between assets as, as such. And again, if we look at the technology development, digitalization, I think there are huge opportunities that we can develop together, both uh, subsea and above surface. And um, uh, last but not least, um, the uh, climate issue. I think there are many areas and issues where we can collaborate to drive uh, the climate issue going forward. So a lot of areas. I think it's just a matter of us um, getting together, discuss this and, and uh, agree on, on a way forward. I, I would like to continue with you uh, on the Sigve because the, the, and going over to another topic, which is a profitable industry in a lower margin environment. Uh, we have been talking about that uh, throughout these sessions today. Uh, what do you think are the most critical changes that we must make together to face a, a lower margin environment? Well, let me put it this way. I think we're already there. We are in a lower margin environment. And if you remember back uh, to uh, the most challenging period since the pandemic and, uh, and the market situation kicked in uh, the spring, we saw globally um, just a negative oil prices. So. Um, players had to pay to get rid of the oil. Um, and uh, that means that we have really to step up and, and, and uh, be prepared for those variations um, in, in the market. Um, so to 
as mentioned by uh, many today, is to work on, on the cost issue um, to see how can we more, uh, work more um, smart and more efficiently, drive down costs together with uh, you as suppliers and, and that we collectively look at the cost issue. Um, I think um, the uh, opportunities that we have within introduction of technology, I mentioned a couple of examples when it comes to um, the introduction of drones. I think that's that's an, an area. Um, but generally, from a kind of a leadership perspective, I think it is the drive and the hunt for improvements and always having an improvement agenda together to, to drive this, this forward. Very good. I would like to go to our suppliers to ask the same question and starting with you, Mats. Uh, any reflection from you on the lower margin environment? Well, you know, I'm tempted to say as a supplier, we've been operating in a low margin en environment for a long time. But on a more serious note, I believe our industry showed what we could do from 2013, 2014 onwards and over the past six, seven years. A lot of uh, cost inefficiencies have been taken out, both internally in uh, companies, but equally important in many of the interfaces uh, in the supply chain. Uh, but at the same time, we, we now see a much less robust supplier industry with you know, companies struggling to survive. Now, going forward, I believe we need to take further actions together to drive out costs, increase efficiency and remove waste. And I think we may have to revisit a little bit how we cooperate. Maybe some of the um, contract models we have need to, to be revisited. Uh, they've taken us to where we are today, but may not be the right ones to take us further. As an example, I think increasing the use of risk reward schemes like joint sharing of upside savings, it may trigger a new wave uh, of ideas uh, and innovations that will be suitable uh, in a lower margin environment. And, and of course, a further drive on digitalization represents a great opportunity for the whole industry. And I think we just started that journey. Very good reflection, Mr. Mats. And also, I get that the invitation from you is to, to change, looking into a contract and working differently. So I, I will, I will uh, bring that with me after this session. Uh, what about you, uh, Uwe? Tell you, I like something Gaia said, uh, where he said predictability is key in the industry. And I do believe that when we as suppliers are able to predict and forecast activity, it allows us to then effectively plan the supply chain and be more efficient in the way we serve you. So that would be one I would point out in addition to the comments that have been made by MAD around digitalization, I still believe that acceleration from digital is absolutely key. One thing I would also add is we would want to see more joint industry collaboration. There are a lot of other areas in the industry that we think we can tap into to be able to increase profitability as we think about the new materials or non-metallics, etc. I think these are areas where we can start to look at technology collaboration with the likes of Equinor, who are very open to this kind of things, for us to then see where else we can break that cost curve to be able to bring it down. Thank you very much, Uvan. Um, let's move forward to uh, not a new topic because we have discussed it several times today, new technology and digitalization. So Guy, for, from your perspective, what is the most interesting technological and digital trends that you see going forward? Well, thank you, Peggy. Well, I, when I, to build on what we said, that we not only will become a marginal business, but we are already in a, a marginal business. Uh, I see that um, the fields that will, we will like to produce is those who have a low operational cost and of course a low CO2 emission. And sometimes I see how much extra we need to put on a on an installation to have people on the installation. Living quarter, helideck, fighter fighting for the helicopter and a lot of things. Mm. So if we 
and we I think we have demonstrated that through the last half year that we can move this pretty fast. So if we could make more unmanned, I think the investment cost of building will be less. I think we can um, uh, utilize the drones and everything uh, in a faster way. And I think the operational cost will be much lower. So if I should pick one favorite, it must be the unmanned production platforms um, and utilizing the digital tools in the fully in, in the full scope. Thanks, Geir. And then, then uh, Uwe, uh, if if I pick up what Geir is saying, you know, unmanned is really essential in the future. Uh, automated drilling operations that you are working with is the, is an essential part of that. So, what has helped you to get where you are with the automated drilling operations? I would say one thing, uh, which has been first the support we have seen uh, extensive from Equino wanting to push the envelope. Uh, we know we are on this automated drilling journey, applying this on 10 rigs today in Equino. So that forward vision has helped you set the pace for other customers and uh, countries uh, to follow. So I would say that's the first uh, point. The second point that has helped us get there, in all honesty, has been the contracting mechanism where you said, I will reward you for good or excellent or top notch performance. And that's forced us to go back and say, what else can we deploy to be able to get to that threshold that has been set for us by you all? And that's where that automated drilling has come in, you know, the unmanned operation, drilling a well section. But I see one other benefit this has brought to us is the development of competency in our remote operations center, where you're now having that drilling engineer or remote operations engineer being able to look at more than one operation at a given time, thereby speeding up that ability to learn and see different scenarios that helps in competency development and further helping solve issues and problems that may arise coming out of the operations. Yeah, so technology, competence, performance based contract will be important going forward. And then, uh, Mats, before I let the question to you, I just wanted to say to the audience that uh, when when you were speaking, we were testing the digital twin and the HoloLens, so we have seen that it works actually live as well, but even though it didn't uh, play with us in the moment. But um, what has helped you to get to where you are with respect to the digital twin and HoloLens? Well, Peggy, my my understanding that this is this is all more about people than technology. Just like we talked about the use of teams, how that exploded when we had to, because uh, we have been using the 3D ge geometrical model for years in our design and engineering work, and all the data records and everything used in the uh, digital twin has been data available for in you know some form or shape. But the digital twin and what we attempted to show you today was uh, born when we let creative and skilled employees from both of our companies work together using the available P2 platform data. And then there a lot of opportunities uh, came out of that because the Microsoft HoloLens is widely used in the industry. But then our people saw that this technology could be applied in particular on the final inspection of modules during construction and actually particularly before they were sent to painting so they didn't have to be returned. So the real task was then to fit the gigantic digital twin model into the limited hollow uh, lens environment. And that task actually was solved by specialists uh, in Equinor. And I believe we've just seen the beginning of use of AR and other digital tools. And I think we'll see a wide use of these technologies in years to come, uh, onshore, offshore, and it will contribute to making um, our industry more competitive and also be very engaging for our employees to work with. Talking about the engagement and also about the uh, uh, competence and skills. Uh, uh, this has also been a question from, from our suppliers. Uh, um, and I will start with you, Geir. What skills and actions does Equinor expect from the suppliers in the energy transition? So when it comes to skills, I, I, I see that what we have experienced in our industry is that when things get tough, 
we seem to be collaborating better. And when things go good, then the trouble starts. So if the future is a marginal business, I need, there's two ways to solve it, is to see who can outperform the other, or rather see how can we then collaborate to solve it together. And I am on the last sentence how to do it. <clears throat> and if I look into marginal business, uh, industries that, that has been there for a long time, I think we need to be much stronger on standardization. Um, but of course, there will be um, technology steps, uh, but still rather say, how much can I do with the existing equipment instead of saying, how can you adjust it a bit to make it perfect for, for my project? So the tailor mating I think, needs to go out and we need to utilize the available technology and equipment that is in there. I think the industry need to force me to use the existing equipment and rather say, if you want something specialized, it's too expensive and you shouldn't have it. This one is sufficient for what you can do. And maybe in the next three years time, the next generation will come and then we take a new step together. But we can't make the industry build tailor-made solution for all of us. Yeah, so tailor-made is definitely nothing you would like to take from from the oil and gas industry and in, into renewables, I would guess. It's more standardization, simplification and industrialization. So, so honestly, that has also been a question uh, from, from supplier. What key lessons learned from the oil and gas industry can be applied to renewables? That is a, a very good question and let me just share some some perspectives. I think first and foremost is to start with our people, um, either is within the operator company or in the supplier company um, and, and, and expose them to uh, the broader energy perspective uh, like we now do with our apprentices. So they are exposed and been trained within the oil and gas segment but also within the renewable segment. I think that is that is key and I think now that uh, the gaming amongst our children now will finally pay off. So I think that will be a good thing. Uh, so they are really uh, up to speed when it comes to digitalization and, and gaming and then we just saw uh, what uh, Mats um, uh, demonstrated with, with his colleagues in, in uh, with his colleague in Haugesund. So I think this is just a start. So the competence among our people is is key. And I, I think that, well, there are differences between oil and gas and renewable, but there are also a lot of similarities. Uh, if we look at construction, if we look at design, if we look at maintenance management, if we look at different, uh, different areas. Uh, also, when it comes to collaboration between us as players, uh, I think there's a lot of similarities and things to, to learn across. Um, how we act uh, towards authorities and not least the safety issue. I think there is a lot of issue that we can bring both back to the oil and gas and also from the oil and gas to uh, to the renewable segment. And the, always the hunt for new solutions, new ways of working, regardless whether you uh, for one moment work within oil and gas or renewables, always be curious and hunt for new opportunities. Uvam, you have a couple of comments to this as well. Yes, uh, you know, one thing that's been very interesting to see is the amount of technology in the oil and gas industry that can be leveraged even within the energy transition space. So we talk about carbon storage and that requires compression. And our industry is very big on compression. We've got to be able to leverage that technology and see where we can innovate to drive this forward. We speak about the potential for hydrogen being a key play in the industry down the road. What we are doing now as BK Hughes is beginning to look at how hydrogen can be replacing natural gas in certain jurisdictions where that hydrogen is available. Again, conditioning the turbines that currently exist or the technology that currently exists in oil and gas to be able to play in this energy transition space. So I do believe that uh, we should not underestimate the amount of technology in the oil and gas space that can be brought to play here, thereby allowing adoption to be rapid 
and bringing down the cost to be able to produce renewable energy here. Yeah, and, and I think that is a good uh, reflection, Uwe. Because, and another question that we often get is that if whether Equinor will take an active role in enabling Norwegian oil and gas suppliers to become suppliers for new energy solutions. And, and our response to that has been that uh, our suppliers contribute with significant value to us and partners and maintaining strong relationship with high quality supplier will help uh, giving a sustainable competitive uh, edge. And having said that, we will, uh, together with our partners, of course, select the suppliers that we find best for the work for all agreement awards that we do. But we see that many, many of the Norwegian oil and gas suppliers, and not only the Norwegians, of course, but this was the question that we got. Uh, many of our suppliers are front runners with regards to oil and gas technology development, and we welcome suppliers uh, to, to join us in, in finding the good solutions within renewables as well. We've heard several examples for the, uh, of this today and, and Abel and Baker that are present today with us are, are some of them. And we also have like uh, Kvarnar and Dov and, and several others uh, uh, on Harvin Tampen, for example. So there is a large interest in the supplier industry to join us in, in this journey. And, and we believe that this is right for us and, and it's right for the suppliers. Let's move on to another topic, uh, uh, the project portfolio uh, of Aquinor. Uh, the first one goes naturally to you, Geir. Uh, what do, implications do you see from COVID-19 uh, on the project portfolio? Well, on the COVID-19, um, the first thing is that um, it um, uh, there's a new rules following the COVID-19. It's uh, to keep distance, is to to um, create environment where you can uh, make sure you don't get the virus spread. And uh, we have to follow those and we will follow those and it's important. And we have seen examples where you lose control and then you are shut down and you are shut down for, for a long time. So I think um, uh, the COVID-19, uh, we as um, companies uh, in the industry, I think we have been pretty good to manage the situation. Uh, we have been operating all our production facilities, all drilling rigs have been running, and all projects has been kind of continue running, but they have been delayed due to less people uh, available, and especially where you need international experts or disciplines. It has been limited due to the, the restriction between countries. That is on the ongoing projects. When it comes to the future project, of course, we have um, put the risk into the picture. We have to be prepared that uh, this can happen in the future. And we, at least we have identified the risk and added some um, time to the time scale. But, um, it's not over. That's the, the big thing. And I don't think we can say we have fixed it, uh, but it seems that the systems we have put in place is working very good. And of course, um, delays mean extra cost and it is not a good situation for any of us, of course. But, but the follow up to you, Danga, what about the implication of the Norwegian tax package on your portfolio? So, when, when you lose your income, the easier thing to do, or a big part of your income, is the easier thing is to stop investing. Huh? You don't, what you don't have committed, let's stop that. And of course, the Norwegian authorities has been very kind and said, we don't want it to happen. We don't want it to happen because we are depending on service industry that could support us. And especially with our central partner in the Norwegian um, um, industry, uh, we, we just need to continue. Uh, so the package has served us well. And uh, there's easier in the licenses and partners to support project on the Norwegian continent shelf uh, in these days. Of course, when you can get your investment back in one year instead of over six year, it gives you new fresh money to further invest. But at the same time, I am not going to spoil this opportunity by sanctioning 
unmatured project and lose everything just to treat, try, try to hit within the window. So it has to be matured and qualified project that I need to sanction. And that's where we really need to play together with Abel, with Baker and all the others. How do we develop this robust um, project so we don't misuse the package that is, is given us? Thanks, uh, Gaia. So, so let's move uh, a bit from the Norwegian continental shelf and the tax package and our portfolio here to a more international perspective. And uh, this one goes to you, Ivan, because, uh, and I will phrase the question at, as it has been written. I'm an international supplier wondering what will it take to succeed on the NCS? From your experience as an international supplier, what does it take to be competitive and deliver on the NCS? Thank you, thanks for that uh, question. I would say the first thing is really understanding the local rules and regulation uh, of the geography where we work, and that would also apply to Norway, and then of course, in our operations in the Norwegian continental shelf. And being able to understand those rules implies developing a very strong local workforce uh, who are motivated to work for this international company and also developing leadership uh, from that same country who would have had the opportunity to work internationally and still come back, but then support the company from an international perspective while understanding the local rules and regulations. Uh, the other thing I have learned too from my region responsibility is understanding the interplay and the dynamics between the operator, the regulatory body, and the service industry. And those three groups coming together to discuss issues that are of importance uh, to an international service player like us is absolutely, absolutely important. You know, and sometimes you may have an international player with certain objectives that may not be aligned with what is in country. And you've got to be able to understand that and retailor and repurpose those objectives and alignments to what is specifically applicable in the country. So those would be the two areas I would really pick upon. Uh, the third one I would highlight is probably the technical nuances that are related to operating in the NCS. Uh, I think the regulations are very, very robust, uh, very comprehensive. Uh, the only point I would make is as the industry continues to evolve and we look for new and other ways, or I would say better ways to do things, how do we look at some of those technical requirements and say what may be something we think we can optimize upon based on what we see in the industry here. So those are some of the the place, I would say, from an international perspective, bringing some of those learnings back into Norway to be able to help guide and ensure the industry is profitable. Uh, thank you very much, Rubam. And as a follow up to that, we also got the question related to our Brazil supply chain, including any local content requirements. And I can very much agree with what you say because the local content requirements can be challenging, or you say in Norway, but also in Brazil, as the available capacity and, and, and capability in the industry does not necessarily match the local content requirements. So we see that, for example, within subsea and drilling and well services, we are able to achieve a relatively high degree of local content, but this can be more challenging, for example, for the FPSO fabrication. And, and in addition, uh, you, you were alluding to how you work with the partnerships and the government, et cetera. And local content in Brazil can also differ between different licenses. So uh, for us as well, we have dedicated local like, experts within our Rio team that can insist in, in such analysis, both regards to daily operations, but also in projects like Peregrino and Bacalhau to ensure that we optimize the balance between use of local and, and international suppliers. Then there is another question that um, many are asking about, and that is uh, around how to become a new supplier for uh, Equinor. 
And, and first of all, uh, I would like to start mentioning the three pillars uh, of expectations that, that I have presented uh, for you today. Safe and sustainable deliveries, helping us ensuring a profitable industry, and also contributing with radical improvement. And if you are interested in becoming a supplier to Equinor, I recommend that you register in the relevant pre-qualification systems found under the supplier section at uh, equinor.com. It's a practicality, but it's a very important uh, practicality. And maybe uh, even more important is to be in dialogue with other suppliers that has been awarded com contract that comprises uh, activities such as engineering, procurement, construction and installations. Mm. But I think also we could ask that question to one of our suppliers. So uh, Mats, um, what, what do you think is the piece of one piece of practical advice that you would give to someone who is uh, trying, starting to try out to be an, uh, become a supplier to Equinor? Um, that, that is a tricky question, uh, Peggy. I think you've, you've really covered the, your expectations. If I can frame the question uh, around a new supplier that has a new product or a new technology, valve pump, whatever, that they will um, believe is uh, beneficial to Equinor, uh, on a platform in the well, then my advice simply would be get into a dialogue early with Equinor, either their technical experts and or the supply chain. Uh, I have seen many good products and promising technologies never make it to the market for a variety of reasons. One common one is that it's the um, supplier does not understand how their product fits into a very complex environment like an offshore platform. And many of these pitfalls not, you know, can be avoided by communicating early with Equinor or one of the main or suppliers. And, and in my experience, Equinor will be more than happy to guide potential new suppliers to success or direct them to uh, other um, suppliers um, and be clear on which boxes to tick so they can make it. Thank you for that, uh, that much. And, and there is another question uh, on the same topic. Uh, what about small suppliers struggling to get business uh, from Equinor? And, uh, and to that, I would like to say that Equinor has more than 9,000 suppliers and many of them are smaller. It's, for example, very exciting and interesting to follow the Techstars companies as supplier to Equinor. And further, we have many suppliers which Equinor have research and development studies together with. So going forward, we, uh, we, we expect many new types of businesses and technologies to emerge. And uh, that will be exciting to, for us to follow and also to work with. Um, I think we have, we have time for one more question before we need to, to end the Q&A session. And, and I would like to ask this to you, Arne Sigve. Uh, given the market conditions and pandemic, in what degree have this impacted Equinor medium or longer term strategy? Like, uh, and how does Equinor look like in, in 2030? And do you think that Equinor priorities will change under the new CEO? Thank you for that one, Peggy. Um, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to provide some reflections. Um, in my perspective, the, uh, the strategy of this company stays firm, always safe, high value, low carbon. Um, but we sh what we should also add, there are some principles or prerequisites that we should be aware of together. And uh, that is um, that we have a cash, cash generation capacity at all times. That is what creates business, um, that we have a capex flexibility and uh, that we uh, capture value from cycle, cycles. And that also means that we, in some situation, all, all also will be uh, counter cyclical in, in, in um, um, should I say, initiatives that we take. And the last but not least, that we, um, uh, we are looking for a low carbon advantage. And one reflection from me to you is that through the pandemic and the situation we've been through now since uh, the spring, um, you might think that the climate issue has been lowered on the agenda. That is not the case. 
So uh, you will see that the climate issue from our perspective, but also from a global perspective, will now come very clear on the global agenda going forward. Uh, so I think that is um, something that we should bear in mind. When it comes to Andos uh, and uh, his mandate, uh, I'll just read it to you. And that is what something that he was very clear on when he was announced as the new CEO. And that is to, to accelerate our development as a broad energy company and to increase value creation from our shareholders through the energy transition. And to even be even more specific, to quote him, he said the following, I want Equinor to be a leading company in the energy transition. This demands that we focus on three key areas. Firstly, we will focus and improve within oil and gas. Secondly, we will accelerate growth within renewables. Thirdly, we will create a platform for growth within low carbon solutions through innovation and technology development. So that is his clear message to us. And um, I think as a company, we have already very ambitious climate uh, ambitions. Um, and challenging climate ambitions. Um, and I am sure that on those, based on his clear message on the day he was uh, announced as a new CEO, will will accelerate this work. Um, so I think that on those will definitely see, uh, or under on those, we will see an acceleration of our journey to, to become an even broader energy company. Thank you for that uh, excellent response on Sigva and the time is running and I'm afraid we have to start rounding off. Uh, I would like to thank all of my fellow speakers, Al, Geir, Arne Sigve, as well as both our supplier representative, Uwe and Mats, for great presentations. And thank you to everyone who has dialed in to our first ever virtual supplier day. We hope it has been an interesting event for you. And I look forward to great collaboration in the future. And if I don't see you before, I will hopefully see you at Equinor's next supplier day. If you would like to give any feedback or have questions which hasn't been responded to in this session, please reach out to us at equinor.com. And have a very nice rest of the day. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye.